Lost by the crack and wine, living with Jesus, a new life divine. Looking to Jesus, till glory does shine, moment by moment, O Lord, I am thine. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love, moment by moment, I fly from above, looking to Jesus, till glory shine, moment by moment, O Lord, I am thine. Never a trial that he is not there, never a burden that he doth not bear, never a sorrow that he doth not share, moment by moment. and turn to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 8, looking at the first four verses tonight as to what happened after the death of Stephen. Acts chapter 8 and verses 1 through 4. And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the word of God, and the precious treasure that it is as we take it and use it in our own lives, but as we also share it with others who are lost. We pray that you will make us faithful in doing so. We see here that those who had failed to carry it as they should were then driven to obey. And so, Father, we pray that you will help us to be faithful in our witness, in carrying the word of God to those who have not heard, perhaps even from among this group here, 
carrying it to foreign lands, places where the gospel has not yet been heard. And so we commit this time to you. We pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at this passage tonight, I am reminded of one of the messages that was given at the Dean Bergen Society this past week, where the, the, the pastor who gave the message reminded us of the history of the martyrs who had translated the Word of God, who had had the Word of God in their own possession, and the many who had died as a result of that. And what a heritage we have. It goes all the way back to the days of the apostles, to the days of one of the first deacons here, who was martyred because he feared not man. He proclaimed the word of God. And so we look tonight at this passage in verses 1 through 4. You recall that last week what had gotten him in trouble was he had stated that he had seen the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven visibly standing at the right hand of God. He had pronounced the judgment against these wicked Pharisees and Sadducees on the Sanhedrin and now he declares that he sees Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. And of course our Lord had made reference to the fact that someday from the right hand of the Father he would come and judge. And they could not tolerate that. They stopped their ears, they ran upon him and they took him out of the city and stoned him and they put their coats at the feet of a young man by the name of Saul. So we saw that being a godly Christian does not guarantee physical safety. Here was a godly man. He was clearly a godly man. We see that by the fact that he was chosen as one of the first deacons in Acts chapter 6 and the qualifications that were required of those men as we studied many weeks ago. So we saw that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and still be killed by the enemies of God. You can preach the truth and still be killed by the enemies of God. You can walk by faith and still be killed by the enemies of God. You can use irresistible logic and watertight arguments and still be killed by the enemies of God. But we also pointed out that you never know whom you will reach for Christ as you go to your death as a faithful witness for him. Someday some of us here may be put to death because of our faith, even out of such a small group as this. We look at the political situation here in the United States and we see that that is a very real possibility and perhaps in the very near future. Or perhaps you say, well, it might not happen here and perhaps it won't for a while. But some of you may be called to serve Christ in another country where persecution is still be, being placed upon the saints. And there you might meet your death. It doesn't matter what part of the world. You're still required to live for Christ, still required to preach the gospel of truth, still required to live a holy life, still required to point out sin when you see it, and you may meet a martyr's death, as did Stephen. Perhaps there's someone listening over the internet that will face that someday. Perhaps even someone in a foreign country listening in now. We do not know the moment or the hour of our death, nor the means of our death, God can take us as he will at any time, whether we remain behind or whether we move on out. We see some remaining behind in this passage. We see some moving on out to fulfill the commission that God had given. We saw what takes place at the right hand of God. It's the place of blessing, the place of destruction for the enemies of God, the place of chastening the people of God who rebel. And it's rather interesting because we're going to talk about chastening tonight. What happens to those who had remained behind and had not obeyed what Christ had declared must be done in Acts chapter 1. And very interesting, who goes out? Not perhaps the ones that we would have thought would have left, but others who are different from those to whom those words in Acts chapter 1 verses 8 and following were spoken. We'll talk about that in a moment. The right hand of God is the source of the law of God. It's a place of royal honor, a source of deliverance, a place of joy, a place of sustenance, a place of salvation, the place of victory, the place of righteousness, the place of protection, the place of comfort, the source of God's creative power, the hand symbolizing the sign of promise, the place where Jesus spoke of just before he was condemned to death. And we pointed out how 
important that was to the passage we were looking at last week. The place where Jesus is now. The place where Christ and the Father sent the Holy Spirit. The place from which Christ intercedes for us. The place where we are seen as being in Christ. The position of Christ that sets the standard for our practice in Christ. The place that signifies the finished work of Christ. The place that signifies the superiority of Christ. And the place that shows the divine authority of Christ. Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And so tonight, the message is entitled, Scatter and Obey. Stephen is killed in verse 60 of chapter 7, the immediate preceding verse. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was consenting unto his death. The very next words that we find are the words that establish Saul's guilt. Saul was consenting unto his death. We already knew that he was present at Stephen's stoning back in verse 58 of chapter 7. They cast him out of the city and stoned him, and witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. But the real question is, is Saul guilty? What was his attitude when they laid their clothes down at his feet? Not merely his actions. Did his action, even though passive, rise to a level of culpability due to his attitude and motivation? We need to understand this because many people who have never committed murder <clears throat> have hated someone in their heart. Many people who have never committed adultery have lusted after someone in their heart. You see, God looks far deeper <clears throat> than what we merely do on the outside. They laid their garments down at Saul's feet. Well, was it because he was too tired to stone him? Was it because he was um, too young to stone Stephen? What was his attitude when this took place? One of the things that we learn in law school is how far, when a crime is committed, does the act of the crime extend before a person is guilty of the crime. You discover as you look at the various case law that has come down to us here in the United States that even a motion toward or an attempt at a crime makes a man guilty. Suppose you've gotten together with a, a group of other hoodlums and you've plan, planned to murder someone. And you shoot, but you miss. You know, you're guilty of a crime. You're guilty of attempted murder. Suppose there's a bank robbery that's going to go on. And so <clears throat> the bank robbers decide they're going to hit certain bank at a certain time. They get everything ready to go. And um, they borrow a car. And the man who loans them the car knows that this is why they are borrowing the car. And there's a driver of the car who doesn't go into the bank. In fact, he doesn't even put a mask on. He's merely driving a car. And the bank robbers jump out of the car, and they run into the bank, and they hold up the bank, and they shoot somebody. And uh, in the process of shooting that person, that person is also killed. And uh, they run out of the bank with the loot. They jump into the car, and the driver drives away. Did you know the guilt extends to the driver? And the guilt extends to the man who loaned them the car who knew that it was going to be used to commit a bank robbery. Not long ago, there was a situation where um, there were guys who were stealing ATM machines. What they would do is they would drive up to the ATM machine. They'd hook a, a chain around it, put it to the back of the truck, and pull the ATM machine out of the ground and put it on the back of the truck and drive away. Well, you know, it extended to the fact that somebody else who didn't participate in the crime had loaned them the truck. There were others who were trying to use uh, saws to get into these very difficult to get into ATM machines. They're not made out of tinfoil. And uh, then later they ended up burying the ATM machines. Uh, but everybody, and the guy who had the backhoe, who dug the dirt and who helped them bury the ATM machine was also guilty of a criminal offense. We need to understand, as we look at this situation, why that first phrase is there. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Saul was a guilty party, and we are told that 
not merely because he later persecuted Christians, but we're told this because when the Lord Jesus Christ confronts him on the road to Damascus in chapter 9, he understands that he's a guilty sinner. He suddenly gets the blaze of glory that Stephen was able to see into, and he hears a voice out of the glory, and he says, Who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. You didn't believe it back there, Saul. You're going to believe it now. And it's an instantaneous conversion. And Saul says, What wilt thou have me to do, Lord? What a transformation comes about when the sovereign God of the universe reaches down and through his word speaks to the heart of the lost sinner, one who may think that his hands are clean, think that he has been doing good things as Saul has been hailing men and women and bringing them to prison, but a man who from the eyes of God is totally guilty. And we are all guilty. It doesn't matter whether or not you've done something external. The question is, what is your heart like? And as the scripture tells us, before salvation we are dead in trespasses and sins. The sinner will not want Christ until he is convinced that he is a lost sinner and understands that Christ died for our sins. Paul's converted in Acts chapter 9, but later on as he writes the doctrinal epistles, he refers to his conversion. There are multiple places where he refers to it, but I'd like to draw your attention to two different places where he speaks of his conversion because it will help us to understand what took place. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where he gives us the gospel and Romans chapter 1 where he also gives us the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand. You see, he goes back to a point which Stephen had been proclaiming in Jerusalem and for which he was being put to death. Because the gospel has the precise facts that are necessary concerning who Jesus is and what Jesus did that the Jews at Jerusalem could not tolerate because it was the proof that they were guilty. This is the gospel which Paul says, I have preached unto you wherein you have also received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And he later explains that phrase, which you, have, which you might have believed in vain, when he says, you know, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. The resurrection, the central point of proof that the death of Christ is not only sufficient but efficient for the forgiveness of sin. The whole chapter deals with the resurrection of Christ and an, an argument that without the resurrection we of all men are most miserable and without hope. And he goes on, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. But he goes on. We always look at verses 3 and 4. But he goes on and explains why this is so important. And, after, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom... The greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Now verse 8. And last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul openly admits his criminal offenses. Paul openly admits the point at which he was found guilty. Paul admits to us that he could not save himself. Last part of that verse, but grace is given to sinners who repent and believe. Great grace is given to great sinners who repent and believe, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. A sinner must understand 
his sinful lost condition. He must recognize that the reason Jesus died was not merely because he was a martyr, not merely because he was a misunderstood mystic. They need to understand that Christ, God the Son who became man, died for their sins and was buried and rose again. They must understand the depth of their depravity, the wickedness of their sin. They must be brought to the state of hopelessness that without Christ they are lost. And then as they trust Christ they understand the grace of God. Exceeding abundant grace. Or as John Newton has put it, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. The grace of God. By the grace of God I am what I am. If you are anything, if you are being used as a tool of God in any way, it is not because of your works, it is by the grace of God. His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Grace is never an empty exercise by God. Grace of God is always sufficient and efficient to accomplish what God will do. It is great grace. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. That's great grace. To use a sinful, wretched, proud, haughty scorner. Someone who thinks he's doing right when he's doing absolutely wrong. To take someone like that, to turn them around and place them in a position of responsibility in the body of Christ. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believe. Verse 11. We see Paul also referring to this in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. You recall 1 Corinthians 15 also made reference to the Scriptures. Paul is speaking of the Old Testament promises concerning the coming Messiah. Our salvation is based on the promises of God. The Scriptures, which are the foundation for the Gospel that Paul preached. If you do not have, as we went over this past week at the Dean Bergen Society, a, a preserved text, you do not have any sure foundation for your salvation. Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now listen to verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship. He talked about that, you recall, just a moment ago there in 1 Corinthians. He had gotten the grace of God who had made him an apostle, who had put him into a position of responsibility. It is the grace of God who has given you the spiritual gifts that you have. You don't have the charismatic gifts. Those ceased with the completion of the New Testament canon. But you have at least one of the 15 service gifts that are listed for us in the New Testament. That was by the grace of God that you were given those gifts so that you might serve. By whom we have received grace and apostleship, listen to this, for obedience to the faith. For obedience to the faith. Did you know that when God gives you a commission or a command and he empowers you to do it, that he expects you to obey? Isn't that strange? <laughs> that God would actually expect us to obey. That he would expect us to do something. We're going to see tonight that the church at Jerusalem didn't do what they were required to do. And so God gave them a gentle reminder, a bit of persuasion to get them out of Jerusalem. God expects his people to obey. 
Here, folks, that applies to us. It doesn't just apply to the church at Jerusalem. It doesn't just apply to the, the martyrs of the first, second, and third, and fourth centuries. It doesn't apply to those, just to those who have given their lives in many countries of the world for the word of God. It applies right here at Bible Presbyterian Church in Collingswood. God expects us to obey for the obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. You know where he's taking us? The same place that we discover in the passage in Acts chapter 8 that God took the church at Jerusalem. Not only at Jerusalem, but it says they were scattered abroad into Judea and Samaria. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said in Acts chapter 1? Ye shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. They were scattered, it tells us, directly to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. There in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. We find Paul referring to the uttermost parts of the earth here for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Friends, the commission has not changed. The call has not been watered down. You and I are also responsible for making sure that that is fulfilled because it is the commission that God has given to the church. Some here, as we'll see in the text in a moment, were scattered. Some few remained behind. By the time we get down to Acts chapter 15, we find the council at Jerusalem. There are those with the apostles and James, who is in charge of that council, uh, who are still there in Jerusalem. And we're told in the text here that the apostles remained behind and they didn't get the chastening at that point. It was others who were chastened and who were driven from Jerusalem. We'll talk about why in just a moment, the Lord willing. The second thing that we learn is we have a reminder here that God's methods of enforcing compliance with his commands are not always pleasant methods. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. It doesn't say there was a great persecution against the apostles, try to get rid of the apostles and then it's all over. It was a persecution against the whole church. We have here probably 10 to 12,000 people that have stayed behind in Jerusalem who've gotten saved. They like it there. It's comfortable there. That's where their homes are. That's the big capital city. That's where they can do their shopping at Walmart and Aldi's and all the other things that are so convenient. Very, very inconvenient to be stuck out somewhere where the <clears throat> only place that you can go shopping is a local market where they've got the, the dead animals hanging up by ropes uh, with flies buzzing all over them, and that's where you get your meat. It was a persecution against the church. God was using a rather unpleasant method for making sure that what he had commanded would get done. You know, there's an old saying, the martyr's blood is the seed of the church. And that's true if you look over church history. Even a cursory glance of reading through a very condensed church history will make it very plain that the martyr's blood is the seed of the church. That's what causes growth when persecution arises. That's what causes the gospel to be spread abroad as cast seed is spread to the earth. Has it occurred to you that the church in America has not yet experienced real persecution? Does it not cause you to tremble for just a moment that after more than 200 years we have not seen it here? Do you wonder why we haven't seen it to this point yet? I think it's because the United States, the Bible-believing Christians of the United States, have for the last 200 years been sending forth the missionaries from our Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. But did you realize that by the year 2020, about 80% of the missionary population scattered around the world from the United States? Now, there are other countries that are busily sending out missionaries like South Korea, for example. 
The Philippines are sending out missionaries. There are places where the gospel is gone where they are sending out missionaries, some of them even to Muslim countries like Saudi Arabia, where the Filipinos who are Christians are going and working as household servants, humble positions, so that they might have a testimony among the Muslims. When they're caught, they're put to death. Same thing in Indonesia, largest Muslim nation in the world. But the United States has very, very consistently, for the last 200 years, sent forth missionaries. But by 2012, about 80% of the current missionary force from the United States will be at retirement age. And the numbers are not being enlarged. So many young people in Bible-believing Christian churches have been caught up in the ways of the world. They've been sown in area where the weeds come up and choke out the fruit. And they're fruitless. They've heard the word. They know the word. But the pleasures and cares of this world have strangled it out. If we fail, as a church, to do what God has called us to do as a church, it was the church, you remember, a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. If we fail to fulfill what God has commanded in carrying the gospel of Christ to the rest of the world, what do you think we can expect? We can expect the chastening hand of God. New Testament makes that very clear. Revelation chapter 3 verse 19 states it for us in very concise nutshell terms. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. You see, God looks at our lackadaisical disobedience as a sin that needs to be repented of. You don't have to repent for obeying God. You have to repent for disobeying God. We find that God places his chastening hand upon those whom he loves. This is not talking about judging the wicked for their wicked deeds. It's talking about the chastening hand of the Father on those whom he loves. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. This is written to a church. Not merely written to individuals, it's written to a church. It's the church at Jerusalem that suffered the persecution. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. That's not just a general statement. It also applies to us as individuals. <clears throat> Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Same two words that we see in Revelation. Same God speaking. Rebuke and chasten. Here, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't faint when you're rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth. There it is, the same thing that John tells us in Revelation 3, as many as I love. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Chastening is not always a mild spanking or slap on the wrist. The word for scourging there is a major lashing with a whip. and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Now, <clears throat> some of you are parents, some of you are grandparents. Maybe you've never been married, never have any kids, but you were a child at one time, and you know what chastening is all about. You had parents who disciplined you. And if they were biblical, they spanked you. Scripture makes that very clear, that that is a requirement for parents dealing with their children. 
in spite of the fact that that is politically incorrect, and in some countries of the world today it is a criminal offense. And it may someday become a criminal offense here, and there are certain states whereby physical discipline uh, puts you under the examination of whatever the local DIFAS happens to be. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Takes us back to the book of Proverbs and all of the verses there where it describes how it is to be done. But if ye be without chastisement, that is, if you never got spanked, if God never comes down because he, as a faithful father, will chasten you if you sin, that's what's going on in the church of Jerusalem here in our passage, but if the heavenly father never chastens you, then are ye bastards and not sons, because he does it to all believers, whereof all are partakers. You see, we don't become sinlessly perfect at the moment of our salvation. We don't become sinlessly perfect, did you get that? At the moment of our salvation. We do sin still. John makes that clear over in 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 through uh, 8 through 10. We still have a sin nature. We still commit sins. And because of that, one of the proofs of knowing that you are saved is the fact that the Heavenly Father will chasten you and you know that the reason for whatever circumstances you are going through is because you are being chastened. I spoke to someone not long ago uh, who had gone through a critical situation and uh, had gone to the hospital. And uh, as I talked to this person, uh, I said, Pastor, I know that the reason uh, I went through this is because God was chastening for me for sin. I didn't want to know what his sin was, but he said, I know that that's the reason. It was a wake-up call that God gave to me, and God was chastening me for my sin. Do you understand that when you go through difficult circumstances of life, that some of those circumstances might be because of sin and God is trying to get you back on track with what he wants for your life? Don't just shrug it off and decide that, well, these kinds of things happen to everybody all the time and so it's no big deal. When you go through those kinds of situations... Examine yourself, as Paul said, whether ye be in the faith. It is designed as a chastening instrument from the Heavenly Father to prove that you are one of His children because He loves you. And He wants you to be obedient. For the obedience of the faith, you recall, that's what Paul said. And so we see the church at Jerusalem. But now let's go on here for a moment in Hebrews chapter 12. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we may, might be partakers of his holiness. That's the second reason that is given for chastening. Not merely to get us back on track because we have sinned, bring us to the point of repentance, so that we turn around and go the right direction, metanoia, but so that we will be partakers of his holiness. Chastening is designed to bring us to holiness. When we refuse to live holy lives, as God has designed, because God has given us the power to do so by the indwelling Holy Spirit, when we refuse to yield ourselves to his control, when we refuse to be filled with the Spirit, God's purpose for us is to conform us to the image of Christ, which is a holy image. He will chasten us. He many times will give us a warning shot across the bow, even as we as parents have given warning shots across the bow to our own children. But at some time, the warning shot will hit our boat, which is going the wrong direction, below the water line, and we will begin to sink unless we cry out to him. 
We have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they, that is, these fathers of the flesh, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Do you think the church at Jerusalem enjoyed the chastening that they experienced as they were driven from their homes, driven from their businesses, driven from their bank accounts, driven from their access to all the things that made their lives pleasant? Do you think they enjoyed that? No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. I'm so glad that he put that for the present in there. Because you see, the Christian view is not a view that only looks at the world around us. The Christian view is the view that looks into eternity and sees there the heavenly rewards that God has provided for those who obey him. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. That's what it's like right now. But it does something for us in the future. Listen to the next phrase. Nevertheless, afterward. If you go through chastening, if you handle it right, nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. The fruit of righteousness, that's true holiness of which he has just spoken in the preceding verse. So the second thing, it is a reminder that God's methods of enforcing compliance with his commands are not always pleasant. The third thing is it is a reminder of the order of God's commission. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. We mentioned in passing just a moment ago of how this takes us back to Acts chapter 1. When they were therefore come together, beginning in verse 6, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? You see, they were still thinking Old Testament promises. They were still thinking Old Testament covenants. They were still thinking about Abraham. They were still thinking about Moses. They were still thinking about David. They were thinking about all these great and precious promises that God had given to them. They were thinking about the Old Testament prophets who had prophesied a millennial reign as we see in the last few chapters of Isaiah or major portions of the book of Ezekiel where he talks about the millennial glory. Lord, wilt thou this time restore the kingdom again unto Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Your question has a correct foundation. There is a kingdom coming for Israel, but the timing is none of your business because I have a job for you to do now. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Where were they scattered when the persecution arose against the church? Judea and Samaria. We see the moving out which is the point of the book of Acts, how the gospel begins to spread. It doesn't just sit there at Jerusalem. The church has been around for a while now, but they haven't gotten on with the program that God sent them to do. Now, God can always use somebody else besides us to accomplish his purposes, and sometimes he does that. But here, at the beginning of the church, everybody was sitting at Jerusalem. They refused to move out. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now, you know, there's some very important implications for this. Where had they seen him go up? Mount of Olives, right outside the city of Jerusalem. What did the Old Testament prophets say he was going to come back? He's going to come back to the Mount of Olives and he's going to split it in two. Zechariah chapter 14. 
What's the obvious thing to do if you expect the Lord's return at any time and you want to see Him come back? You stay in Jerusalem! And so the church sat in Jerusalem. They didn't know how long it was going to be because the times and the seasons weren't revealed to them. Jesus had just told them that. But the church decides to stay at Jerusalem. But God had given a commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Had that been done? Certainly had not. Were people being saved in Jerusalem? You know, hand over fist. Absolutely. Was it a fruitful field in which to labor? Absolutely. Were they confounding the gainsayers? Absolutely. Why, why live, leave a place where you see a lot of revival going on and go someplace else? Did you know we have another illustration of this also in Acts chapter 8? We have Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. We have him going from a revival in Samaria where there are lots of people being saved and being put by the Spirit of God down in the desert where there is nobody. But it was there that he found the Ethiopian eunuch on his way home to Ethiopia reading the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit tells him, go up to this chariot. Now, that man would not have been traveling alone. Not only would he have had a chariot driver, but he would, because he was a very important man, and he was a man in charge of a lot of money, he was the treasurer of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. He would have had a retinue protecting him. But God wanted Philip to get through to the chariot. And God made it possible for Philip to get through, and the man invited Philip up with him into the chariot. We'll talk more about that when we get to Acts chapter 8. But there's some incredible things that are going on in that passage. Taken from a great revival to a lone wilderness. And then as we talked about very briefly this morning under the gift of evangelist, because Philip had the gift of evangelist, it says he evangelized, he preached the gospel from there up to Caesarea Philippi where we find him. From, excuse me, Caesarea, where we find him in Acts chapter 21. He says he evangelized that distance. When you work out the chronology of the text, that is 19 years between Acts 8 and Acts 21. And it's only 55 miles to go over a period of 19 years. He evangelized. He preached the gospel all the way up to Caesarea. Oh, if we would only look at what the Bible says, we would suddenly discover all kinds of exciting things. God was going to give him some great revivals as he went along and planted churches, which is what the gift of evangelist is all about. But back to our text here. They stayed at Jerusalem. Hey, Jesus went up in the clouds of heaven from here. Jesus is going to come back here. We're going to live here because, after all, we can get away with that. That, that commission is for somebody else. For somebody else, how often do we say that, oh, this doesn't apply to me, that applies to somebody else? What was your Jerusalem? Has God called you away from the comfort of that Jerusalem? Have you obeyed the call when God called you to go? Perhaps only as far as Judea and Samaria. That's where we see them scattered. Here, there are others who carry it farther than that. But the church at Jerusalem is scattered to the Judea and Samaria. Where were you born? Where were you raised? Where did you grow up? Did God ever call you to go someplace else? Was it an uncomfortable experience in doing it? Did you obey when you were called? I had anticipated, as a child growing up, to have a co-ministry with my dad. I expected to remain in Texas all the rest of my life. And God made a very uncomfortable, unpleasant experience for me. 
whereby he called me away from my Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. Now back to Judea again. First New, G New Jersey and then Alabama. And now back to New Jersey. Other difficult moves. Are you sensitive to the call of God? Do you understand the kinds of things that God uses to move you from place to place? Perhaps you will always remain in the Jerusalem. We see some of them do here. But what have you gone through that might have been God's pressure to get you to go where he called you to go? The fourth thing that we learn is we have here a reminder that God's commission was not just for the apostles, because it says they were scattered abroad except the apostles. You see, we would look at the text and we think, well, oh, that Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and following, it was spoken to the apostles, and so, therefore, it must be only to the apostles. Dear people, you'll discover that a lot of application in Scripture is to you and me as well. They still had work to do at Jerusalem. We see that as we move through the next few chapters. Uh, but then we also discover that some persecution against the apostles arises at Jerusalem. And later on, after James is killed, Peter is arrested and he's put in prison. And God does a miraculous thing in letting Peter out of prison. But we discover that God had still some very specific work for them to do at Jerusalem. He hadn't yet told them to leave for their Judea and Samaria. But he had put the pressure on the church to go and carry the word. They went everywhere preaching the gospel. God moved out some very articulate and bold people from the church at Jerusalem who knew the word of God, who were well trained, and who had the ability to proclaim the truth that God had given them. They went everywhere preaching the gospel. You see, the apostles had a commission also in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. He had given them a commission to go, but he had also given them a commission to tarry. They were central to the revival at Jerusalem. And they had certain gifts that no one but the apostles could do. Sunday mornings we've been going through the, uh, right now, what is our job description, starting with Moses' job description, comparing it with the job descriptions that God has given to us in the exercise of the 15 service spiritual gifts. Not the sign gifts, but the service gifts. Challenging us to search the scriptures, to look at each of those, to see which ones God has given to us, and begin to serve. The fifth thing that we learn is God often uses evil people to accomplish his goals, even with believers. It says, and Saul, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. You can look back over the centuries and you can see how very true this is as it occurs on multiple occasions. Look back to the time of the Reformation, something that most of us know a little bit about. When the word of God, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, suddenly burst forth again through the pens of John Wycliffe and later John Puss, and then we find Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and others of the reformers, Knox in Scotland. Did they have a wonderful opportunity and experience where there was no opposition? Or did they experience the opposition, persecution, torture, and even death at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church? God often uses evil people to accomplish his goals. Look at Hitler in World War II, persecuting the Jews. There were those who were called by Israel even today righteous Gentiles. 
There are special memorials to the righteous Gentiles in Israel today. Hiding the Jewish people in their homes, helping them across borders, helping them to escape, providing them with food, refusing to turn them into the Nazis, though it was required by law. God used persecution, both of the church and of the Jewish people, for two different reasons. With the church, he was purifying the church. With the Jewish people, he was preparing them to have a deep longing an intense desire to return to their land, which he accomplished as many, many, many Jews returned to Israel. And on May 14, 1948, the nation was born in a day as prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. God often uses unpleasant means to fulfill his promises and his commands in Scripture. And God often uses evil people to accomplish his goals. Saul is an unsaved man. He thinks he's good. How many people do you know that you know are lost, but they think of themselves as good people? You've got neighbors like that. They don't need God. They don't need church. They don't need the Bible. Because they're good people. It's often those who think of themselves as the very best of the good people who become the oppressors of God's people. The sixth thing that we learn is some remained behind to carry on the work in Jerusalem. It says, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And we find, as we mentioned a few moments ago in Acts chapter 15, there are still those who are the apostles and elders there in Jerusalem, there is still a church in Jerusalem. Not everybody got scattered. There were people still being saved. The church in Jerusalem was still growing, but under a different set of circumstances than the initial victories that had been won before the persecution began. The next thing that we learn here is when you see a therefore, ask what it's there for. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. You know, if it had been only the apostles scattered abroad, or if the text had not made it clear that the apostles stayed behind, and then later we discovered that the church leadership, the elders there at the Jerusalem, had stayed behind, then we would think that, oh, they went everywhere preaching the word. Oh, that's the apostles. Oh, that's the church leaders. Oh, that's the elders. Oh, that's the missionaries. But because the text tells us, therefore, they that were scattered abroad, and it makes clear to us, except the apostles, it gives us clear indication that this is what we would call the laity. Are you witnessing now where you are? Are you clear and bold in it, even though it might cost you your job? Or it might cost you your friends? Or it might actually raise the eyebrows of somebody that you've met in the grocery store, whereby they sneer at you? Did you know that if we are not faithful in our witness, the means that God uses, the method to get us to do our job is persecution. And when that happens, all of a sudden, when God gives us that kick in the seat of the pants to move us out the door, we begin to understand that he has called us to share the good news of Christ. There's an awful lot that we learn here in these four verses. It's a lot that deals with our obedience to what we know is the will of God. We know it's the will of God because he has revealed it in his word and we can't push it off and say, oh, that's for somebody else. It applies to us too. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. 
And as we look at the book of Acts, we see the way in which you are working as you spread the gospel of Christ away from the center of comfort to areas where it's not so comfortable. And as we move through the book of Acts, we see it being spread to the uttermost parts of the earth by the very one who had persecuted the church at Jerusalem. What divine irony. But you used a man who understood the grace of God because he understood his vile, wicked, lost condition. And so when he was a, sh a saved man, he was unashamed of that gospel everywhere he went. He knew what could be the consequences. He had seen the death of the first martyr. He knew what might happen. He had seen the brutal stoning of Stephen. He suffered many things. He describes them for us as he describes his travels of the times that he was beaten, the times that he was stoned, the times that he was shipwrecked, the times that he was hungry, the times that he went through what we would call very unpleasant circumstances. But he was a man who, knowing the truth, seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in the blaze of glory of the Shekinah, of which Stephen had spoken, was a man who would not be turned from his mission. Father, make us men and women like that. Those who truly understand the call and the empowerment that you have given. The call of our Lord Jesus Christ, the empowerment of the Spirit of God. And make us faithful in our witness, lest you must come and chasten the church to get us to do what you've called us to do. Again, Father, we thank you for this portion of your word and pray that you will bless it to our hearts. For we pray it in Jesus' name.